Okay, so um, the class, uh, as you know, um, through our announcement that today we were going to we were going to have a talk by Dr. Dean Polina. Um, uh, I had already shared on the um, on our LinkedIn group uh, his bio as well as the abstract of his talk. So and and you are all you know expected to see that, and I hope you have seen that. So I will not. Uh, belabor that point, and I'll just turn over to Dr. Polina. Okay, well, thank you very much. The first thing I, I really want to do is to uh, thank you all for, for coming. I appreciate all the support from, uh, from Dr. Uh, Sheff, from uh, Dr. Matthews, and uh, the College of Engineering and Computing. Thanks, thanks for having me. Um, what I'd like to, to do, uh, just to give you the overview of my talk and then I'll tell you a little bit about, I'm sorry, just to give you the title and then I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm gonna be speaking about credibility assessment, new uh, technologies and test uh, formats. Um, this is a bit of an overview. While uh, you're looking at that, I'll tell you a bit about who I am. I uh, earned a PhD in experimental psychology from Stony Brook uh, University in 1994. Uh, I took uh, many neuroscience courses and I was very interested in statistics. I, um, what I did for my PhD work way back then was a uh, uh, dissertation study where I tried to work out a way to use brain waves as a, a so-called lie detector. Uh, and I was interested in, uh, in deception. I did my, uh, as I was saying, I did my dissertation on that, but uh, since then, I've sort of moved away from those central nervous system measures, and uh, I'm looking uh, for the last several years, I've been uh, working at the National Center for Credibility Assessment, which is a, um, which is a DOD entity at, out at Fort Jackson. And it used to be, just to give you a little background, I mean, it used to be the Polygraph Institute. So those of you are, I'm sure you're familiar with polygraphs, or at least have seen them or, or heard of them. Uh, so that's what we sort of used to do, and I got hired on to do some of the newer technologies. Uh, my current mission as a scientist at NCCA uh, in research branches to research, develop, and test uh, credibility assessment systems, recommend the use of those new systems and technologies uh, through laboratory and field testing, and uh, to enhance the capabilities of credibility assessment. So we've sort of broadened our scope. We've got that new name, credibility assessment, and we're looking at uh, some brand new technologies. So I'm going to go through just you know real quick uh, uh, an overview. I'm going to talk about the problem itself when, and how we're trying to deal with the uh, issues related to credibility assessment. I'll then go over some of the uh, first wave uh, ways that people are now in the field doing that kind of thing to include polygraph, but also uh, behavioral analysis interviews and other ways that people tend to, uh, uh, you know, st ha te current techniques and technologies that have been vetted and, and are currently used. Uh, and then I'll go into some of the newer tools with a focus on um, what I've been working on the last few years, which is uh, computer generated interviews, kind of human computer interaction and uh, uh, relationship between um, uh, how we can automate how we can automate some of the uh, uh, polygraph and some of those related technologies. Uh, in the process of doing that, I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, ways of ground truth. Uh, one of the things you have to do in order to test these uh, and vet these uh, instruments is to is to be able to understand ground truth. And for that, we typically use vernacular. We call it a mock crime or a, uh, a simulation of a crime so that we can then see uh, who the, uh, we'll know uh, and can assign to groups, the deceptives and non-deceptives. Um, so what I'd, what I'd like to do, um, if I could, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of at a disadvantage in that I don't know how this, this class is typically run. Uh, but in, in this case, I would, I would like if, if it's possible to be able to have you uh, jump in whenever you can. I'm hoping that this relationship may continue in some way. And so I'm, I'm just as interested in what interests you, uh, hopefully that you're interested in what interests me. So, um, so uh, the, to jump right off into uh, 
the evolutionary perspective, um, obviously this 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 problem of credibility assessment deception is a very big and multidisciplinary pro problem. Uh, the um, um, uh, it encompasses more than any one field. And so that's been a challenge, uh, but it also has been very rewarding to be able to, to work with various uh, groups to include engineers, um, computer scientists, but also um, MDs, physiologists, and, uh, and many other sociologists um, dealing with this problem. Um, starting out, um, I think an evolutionary perspective is important. Um, uh, certainly deception is not unique to humans. We have uh, throughout the animal kingdom, we have mimicry and camouflage. Um, one of the uh, buzzwords is brood parasitism. So you could see on that, uh, on the photo on the right, that uh, uh, it's, a, it's actually a, um, I believe it's a moth with uh, what looks like two big eyes. So that's, you know, uh, evolved resemblance uh, where predators perceive similarity between, um, in this case, a mimic and a model, right? So, de so uh, deception is, uh, you know, uh, seen throughout uh, the animal kingdom. But uh, in the, uh, when we, moving away from those simple uh, sort of mimicry and uh, biological constructs, uh, behavioral variations on those kinds of scripts um, are seen in humans, obviously, but, but in a very sort of scripted way, maybe in some ways, not certainly not conscious. So for example, basketball players aiming toward the basket as if to throw it in. Uh, a lot of research with soccer players and uh, which way the ball is gonna, you know, uh, if, um, if, if the goaltender knows which way the ball is gonna be kicked toward which part of the uh, goal, then they'll be able to block it. So it's sort of trying to outsmart them on that. But this is, uh, this is it's behavioral and it, it's certainly a step up from mimicry, but it's not, uh, uh, it's, it, it's, it's not maybe deception in the way uh, we typically think of it. Um, so, um, in terms of uh, deception, there is also, uh, when we typically think of deception, we do think of some amount of self-awareness. And so um, uh, this is where uh, you start to see the recursive nature of self-awareness, uh, creating those chains of reasoning, kind of like, um, uh, you know, Sherlock Holmes and who, uh, you know, if you knew that I knew that you knew uh, that I knew kind of game theory and that recursion, um, it actually is uh, an important concept for some of the studies that I'm gonna show you uh, later on. Um, so superimposed on that reflexive self uh, that knows, uh, knows that, it is, it's, you know, that, that I know that I'm a self, but I know that there, there are other selves interpreting myself. So that's, um, that allows for cognitive empathy and perspective taking. Um, superimposed on that, we have um, self-deception and, uh, um, and norms and relations with other people. In other words, we know uh, we know um, what is the right way or wrong way to act. We know when we're doing something that is uh, outside those norms. And we typically, uh, we, we uh, as humans, uh, we try to um, uh, get back to at least uh, convincing ourselves that we're doing the, the normal thing. Um, in terms of detective lives, behaviorally, uh, historically, research has shown that uh, humans are, are actually pretty poor at detecting lies. Um, and the behaviors that are um, typically studied include um, 
it runs really runs the gamut. Um, uh, you know, um, any kind of behaviors that uh, you can think of have been studied. Um, there, um, one of the theories is that for example, some of the nonverbal types of behaviors, um, like where you're looking, um, adapters, adapters just means um, uh, unintentional, like uh, self touching or tap, tapping your foot, scratching, those kinds of things. Um, the theory goes that when people are lying, they tend to focus on the, the well, the, 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 the channels that we typically think of, where am I, I, am I looking them in the eye, that kind of thing. Whereas uh, the, the other, some of those other channels are, uh, are, are less monitored, self-monitored. And so there might be some so-called linkage, uh, leakage there. But it, in any case, people are not very good, and uh, there may be several reasons for, for this. Um, one theory is that people are just relying on uh, cues that are not valid, but that there are valid cues. And uh, Paul Eppman has studied this for many, many years. He, you may have heard of him, and certainly uh, he's known in, uh, uh, for the, uh, for the um, uh, studies of automating facial expressions um, in order to, uh, you know, um, using a computer to, uh, to try to determine whether, uh, you know, which emotional states people are in. He actually had a show on, uh, on TV for a couple of years as well. That was his idea. There's also uh, a theory that there, there, frankly, just aren't any valid cues. Uh, that one's by Maria Hartwig. We have worked with her as well on uh, some projects, um, which I'll get to in a, in a little while. Um, there's a third idea that uh, there are, are individuals that can lie and some individuals who are just not as good at lying and that we can catch most of those. Uh, and I'll also show you some research uh, of my own and our own here at uh, NCCA that uh, suggests that deception may be a kind of umbrella term um, in terms of uh, the current methodologies for behavioral detection of uh, deception, they really are mostly uh, involving interviews, sort of a semi-structured kind of interviews. One of them is called the behavioral analysis interview. Um, and there's also statement content analysis. These are the types of interviews that interrogators would use. Um, and there are some theories attached to them. So for example, um, uh, a current theory that when you actually, when you're telling the truth and you actually remember a series of events, that there will be some subtle differences between that and when you have to fabricate those events, that the, that the memories will be um, less abstract um, and, and certain other, they'll have certain other characteristics that fabrications don't. But the point is these are, these are, these are actual, uh, 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 interviews that are used currently. And then the third big one is polygraph. Uh, polygraph is used throughout federal government and in the states and throughout the world. Um, for those of you who don't know, polygraph is typically uh, uh, what happens is uh, uh, you're asked a series of your physiology is monitored. While that's happening, you receive a series of yes or no questions. Um, um, one type of polygraph is specific to a crime that had been committed. So if you're a suspect in that crime, you will be asked uh, specific yes or no questions while your physiology is being monitored. And uh, uh, interestingly, and this will become important in a, in a mo moment, uh, the question, uh, questions during a polygraph are always reviewed so that the, during the actual testing, the, the interviewee knows all the questions that are going to be asked. Uh, this is just to give you a little historical perspective. Um, I'm not sure you're going to be able to read those questions on the, on the right there, but uh, those are actual questions that we had in our archives at NCCA. This was from a 1936 the Lindbergh kidnapping. This was uh, Lucky Lindy. This was the guy who actually, uh, you know, a pioneer in the uh, um, aeronautics who had uh, his baby kidnapped and uh, 
Dr. Keeler there was actually a, uh, testing a suspect. So the, uh, the ways that physiology is measured during polygraph have changed little over the past almost uh, better part, maybe even a century. Uh, they include uh, changes in um, sweat, sweat changes uh, measured just uh, using a potentiometer, breathing changes, uh, piezoelectric usually, just uh, so um, straps across the chest and cardiovascular changes that are measured, indirectly measured. So it's, it's, it's in the vernacular, it's called blood pressure, but it's not really blood pressure. It's uh, more of the volume of blood changes as, uh, uh, as you become more physiologically aroused. Uh, one other thing to keep in mind with traditional polygraph, there are uh, several, uh, there are two main types of polygraph that are administered, um, certainly in the States and, and some, other, some other countries as well. There, as I mentioned previously, the, um, the specific issue polygraph, which is where a crime has been committed uh, may say the 7-Eleven has been robbed. There are some suspects and they're tested on that, on that crime. So there's a narrow focus. You're able to focus on that 7-Eleven that day, that time. Uh, questions are known, nature of the crime is known, case facts are known. In a screening exam, which uh, interestingly makes up a much larger percentage of the tests that are actually uh, administered in the United States, uh, there are broader focus, and typically the screening exam is for people who are applying for or are involved in working in positions of positions of trust. So uh, we need to. Uh, so during these types of exams, they're different mostly because the examiner doesn't know um, uh, what the examinee may or may not have done. So it is a broader focus. The nature of the infractions are, are are not known, and and the other thing to keep in mind is that most people are, um, uh, in terms of severe infractions, uh, most people are innocent of those, and so there's a very low base rate uh, of deception, which makes uh, presents some unique challenges as well. Now the the CIT is a uh, Another type of test, maybe you could almost say a third type of test. Uh, for, a, for this type of test, uh, a CAT, CIT was developed by Dr. Lickin in 1959. Uh, just to give you uh, maybe a flavor for how this works, it, uh, since we're in a computer science department, I'll, I, I thought of this one uh, this morning. So if I asked you, what is the uh, name of the curve that um, an idealized hanging chain assumes under its own weight. So the idea of this question, if I don't give you the answers that some of you will know and some of you, well, maybe you all know, but the idea is that a word that may or may not have popped into your mind, that's information that you either know or don't know at this moment. And uh, that's kind of how the CIT works. So in terms of a specific crime, if you stole, let's say a person steals a red car, they know it's red, uh, but the uh, other suspects who were not involved would not know that. The CIT is well, well known and, and well loved in academia because it's, you know, it seems valid, more valid than some of the other tests we'll get to. It, uh, it seems like uh, it's got a good theory behind it of why it would work. And there are some strengths to it. One problem with the CIT is that you have to be very careful in administering the test because, uh, for example, if I didn't notice the color of the car or uh, didn't notice whatever the uh, key items that you might, uh, um, as the person who designs the test, if that per, if the uh, if the person being tested uh, didn't notice that, um, then you're going to get a false negative. Uh, Skin conductance is, uh, is typically used in it. And we'll talk about, again, this is the sweat response. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a very, it's a low frequency response. It's very obvious. It's sort of bigger is better. Um, 
when it's a, it's, it's pure autonomic uh, sympathetic arousal. When you become aroused, the, uh, you know, the, what happens is the, you, uh, you sweat more and that uh, 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 typically it's uh, measured uh, using skin uh, conductance, sometimes skin resistance, but so for conductance, you would become more conductive and you would have a, uh, the potential would increase and uh, you would get the uh, sort of bump that we're looking at here over here. Uh, again, there are pluses and minuses with all these types of tests. Just to give you another flavor of uh, some of the things that we do in our lab, this was a CIT that we actually ran. We ran the CIT. Uh, we had someone, uh, uh, troops, uh, uh, subjects go in uh, on Fort Jackson, stab a dummy and steal money out of a purse. <laughs> not, most, uh, not one of the most... Uh, uh, that's one of the good things about the CIT. You don't have to be too creative uh, if the person knows. And in this case, it was the weapon that was used. And uh, we were looking at thermal. The big interesting thing we were looking at, we were looking at, could we use thermal imaging to uh, instead of traditional polygraph measures? Uh, I'll talk about this in a moment. But again, we just used, uh, well, used that. And uh, um, one of the things we do uh, run into a lot is um, is that a lot of the things that are developed are proprietary. We don't have that problem. So we were able to publish a simple logistic regression. Uh, this was 2006. I've never heard whether this was ever replicated or not, but uh, we got some interesting results uh, where, that you can see on the right. These, these are very fast. We're looking at uh, uh, changes in uh, blood, uh, changes in um, temp ultimately temperature that we think is due to uh, blood flow but uh, changes in temperature uh, less than a second. I mean, this happens in uh, uh, hundreds of milliseconds rather than seconds. Um, so uh, one other thing that, uh, that I just wanna, I'm not gonna go into great detail, but this may be of interest to folks who don't, um, uh, haven't studied polygraph. Um, one of the problems with field studies of why, why they're not very useful is because you never know ground truth. You never know exactly who did or didn't do, um, uh, if they're accused of a crime, even if they're convicted of a crime, you're not sure um, what happened. And so, and there are some biases that go into that as well. So if someone gets away, uh, you'll never know, you'll never know that. And so what you think is ground truth is you know, can be systematically biased. But one study that we looked at, this was um, back uh, quite a few years ago now, but we looked at traditional polygraph with the same, uh, it was the same instrument, same sensors, um, and uh, same polygraph question format. So we tried to equate as much as we could. And we looked at uh, lab cases that we knew ground truth involving the stealing of a ring, uh, versus uh, field cases where, um, you know, and we, when the question really was, well, how, you know, these simulated studies, how much do they, just in terms of the physiology, how much do they um, approximate uh, what's, what you see in the field? And the answers were that, uh, so we're mixed. Um, they were mixed in the sense that when you, when you look at the uh, field and lab data, uh, if you use, again, I like re logistic regression, not because it's particularly accurate, but because it's standard. It's a way we can, uh, everybody, it's pretty straightforward how it's, uh, um, what we're doing. And so we can, it, it's, it's a nice um, uh, sort of gold standard for, for um, uh, looking at uh, um, accuracy rates. Anyway, uh, if you look at the percent correct, you can see, and this is interesting, you know, some people ask how accurate is polygraph? Well, in this particular study, the, those are the numbers. Um, what you see is that, uh, you know, pretty accurate. Again, this was a specific issue, polygraph. So it was, you know, uh, narrow focus. Those are the easiest types of tests to administer. But you're in the high 80s uh, down to, uh, little lower in the, not in the uh, lab cases. The important thing too, well, one thing, there are no inconclusives. If you run a polygraph in the field, they'll give you one of three uh, things that happen. Either you pass 
you failed or there was no opinion. Uh, for this logistic regression, we just uh, simply uh, made a call on anybody. If it was uh, above 0.5, we said that uh, you know they were uh, deceptive. And if it was below, then we said they were not. So we made call on everybody. And you could see those are pretty much the numbers. But from my perspective, the interesting thing was uh, that the channels were rated a different, uh, so, so the, uh, if you looked at the uh, ROC curves and some of the other, uh, if you looked at the different channels along in isolation, um, the laboratory uh, polygraphs were almost, almost all due to the sweat response. The cardiovascular response didn't really enter into it. The, in the field, the cardiovascular uh, response was more diagnostic. So that was interesting. And we think we know why that is. I'll get to that hopefully in a moment. Real quick, these are just some questions that you might, these are actual questions. You might ask what types of questions on a polygraph. The main types of questions are, again, the relevant to the specific crime. Uh, so if you sold that electronic device, that would be a crime relevant question. Same basic question asked in subtly different ways. There's also so-called comparison questions, which are um, compared to the relevant questions. There are questions that um, are not related. They're relevant in a certain way, but they're not related to the actual crime. And then there's so-called crime ill, uh, sorry, crime irrelevant questions, such as are you sitting down that are just designed to uh, um, bring the person back down the baseline, uh, uh, calm them down and they're not, they're not threatening at all. Uh, so before I go on to the new, uh, some of the new technologies, does, does anyone have any questions that they're able or willing to, or want to ask? Yeah, I have one. Sure. Um, so how effective are is current polygraph technology in dealing with um, neurologically atypical individuals? Um, such as psychopaths and um, mm -hmm. sociopaths to some extent? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. And um, unfortunately, well, I'll say most of the research, and there hasn't been much, but most of the research on that particular issue, specifically psychopathy, was done in the 60s and 70s. Actually, I guess now that you mention it, most polygraph research was really done in the 60s, 70s, trailing off in the 80s. There's not as much uh, nowadays, uh, but to answer your question, uh, so the results of those studies, for the most part, suggested that sociopaths were uh, detectable by polygraph, and uh, there are many theories of why, but the main, uh, main theory is something called the duping delight. This is, again, this is Paul Ekman and his facial expression uh, guy, but the, uh, the idea is that, you uh, know, Deceptives, although maybe they're not quite as, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, the people who are um, sociopaths, they're not so much afraid of being caught, but they're, they're, they're more interested in sort of, they get a, they get a high or a delight out of uh, beating, beating the uh, examiner, and that actually is their undoing. So there's been a couple of studies on that. Nothing I would frankly, nothing that I would hang my hat on. And again, they're old studies, but hopefully that answers your question uh, somewhat. Yeah, um, as a sort of tie-in slash follow-up question, um, that was, uh, I guess, a question about psychopathy and sociopathy. Um, what yeah. about individuals uh, expressing uh, apathy, uh, people who are emotionally shut down? Um, is there any difference in perception for polygraphs for them? Um, so I have to get into, a, that's a great question, another great question. Uh, and and it's a, I'll, I'll have to go in a little bit into the theory of, uh, so polygraph is um, almost always within subject. So it's almost always you're comparing you know, that person, uh, Jane Doe to Jane Doe, uh, when she answers one question versus when she answers a different question. And so it's not like you have a database and you compare, you know, two standard deviations over or under on that. It's more, uh, so a person, so, so that's a way, 
in some respects to deal with individual differences of which there are many. <laughs> you know, it's the bane of uh, human uh, subject research that uh, you know there's a lot of a lot of individual differences. But one way of dealing with that and is is again to sort of uh, norm them to them, to norm the subject to themselves. So, in your case, a person who was uh, you know someone who is um, uh, apathetic or maybe depressed, uh, maybe having a, even say having a major depressive episode, they may or may not be able, and if they're in a major depressive episode, they may not be able to take a polygraph. But uh, someone who's, you know, mildly depressed, they're going to be mildly depressed throughout the interview. And so there should be, we think in most cases, those folks are testable. Um, one, one question I really frankly don't have the answer for is someone who's overtly psychotic, you know, if, if, you know, that's, that's going to be a challenge, but uh, for the most part, um, mild, those kinds of mild personality things uh, should still be, you should still be testable. Great. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So I'm going to uh, speed up here. What I'm basically going to do is go into some of these newer whiz bang technologies, but the main reason I'm doing this is again to see where uh, you folks uh, might have an interest in uh, ways, because we're looking for ways to improve. We're always trying to do that. And so um, we are not, uh, frankly speaking, uh, you know, we are in a lab stage with a lot of these technologies. We have had some troubles getting from, we get some good results in the lab. I guess it's like anything else. Um, you know, but trying to get from the lab prototypes to a fielded model is where we tend to have a lot of the, you know, um, you know the challenges. Um, and you can see that up there. So real quick, uh, one of the things we're looking at is uh, bringing, uh, bringing uh, eye movement and tracking and uh, pupillometry. Pupillometry is, uh, so if you look at the right, uh, that uh, the guy in these sort of looks like a mask, that's actually a pupillometer that's attached and uh, we administered the whole interview. While that's happening, we can we can record their uh, uh, their pupillometry, the diameter of their pupils, which changes. Uh, it's it's a similar. It's a it's an autonomic sympathetic response. We believe there's it actually un, unlike the uh, sweat response does have a a parasympathetic component, so it's a biphasic type of response. But it, we think it it may uh, convey as much information. We might be able to. Uh, dispense with the sweat response if we can really get get this um, pupillometry going, but there are challenges. Obviously, ambient ambient light ambient light's an issue, and other things. Uh, thermal imaging. I'll touch upon it. You're going to see a little bit more of that in a moment. Uh, but thermal imaging is um, something that we uh, have been looking at for quite some time now. Many corporate partnerships with uh, Battelle Memorial Institute. Uh, a smaller uh, engineering outfit called Azimuth out in um, West Virginia, the University of Houston's computer science program. I'd be curious if any of you have come across a guy named uh, um, Giannis Pavlidis. Uh, Pavlidis is a computer scientist who came up with, shortly after 9-11, came up with this idea. Uh, he got a paper published uh, with our help. He actually ran the study out at out at Fort Jackson, but the uh, the idea was that the if you look between the the eyes, you can see temperature increases. Um, Pavlidis's theory was that that was to do with uh, getting blood oxygenated blood to the eyes, and so um, yeah, we worked with him out at the University of Houston for some time, uh, and then the automated interview, which I'm also going to go into. But those are some of the main areas. There are others. Just uh, touching on some of the main areas that we look at. There's that article, uh, the Pavlidis article I just talked about. This was way back in 2002, got published in uh, Nature. Uh, one of the th unfortunate things, this is a great example of something that uh, looked good in the lab, but we just were never never able to field it. Uh, if you look at the picture, the sorry, the graph on the upper right, you can see some of the problems with head tracking. Head tracking, uh, especially back in those days, was difficult. It was 3D uh, moving, you know, a, a, a irregularly shaped object moving through space and time as we were trying to lock onto what ultimately was a very small response and a very rapid response. And you can see some of the ugly red uh, you know, misses on the track there. 
And we can see we've, we've started a project, uh, head tracking is something we've been interested in for many, because a lot of these technologies have to do with head tracking. And um, we have a, uh, we had a study just wrapped up out at Azimuth where we looked at head tracking with, um, with a 3D tracker that actually, we scanned the face and uh, we, we actually knew, so it was a, uh, we knew, um, we knew exactly where the head was because we had a, a head tracking equipment and we were able to um, scan the face and lock on to that. But in any case, uh, you can see this was the first attempt to, uh, to do some uh, sensor fusion. We had the traditional polygraph measures, but we also had um, Pavlidis's measure. And in the early days, you could see there was, and again, this is nothing to really write home about, but it was, it was a small sample size. But uh, you know there were there was a uh, uh, significant effect of uh, combining all those sensors, and uh, this gives you uh, maybe an updated version of uh, Dr. Pavlidis's work. This is from one of his grad students' work, um, and you can see the idea uh, here: the carotid artery. Uh, they're, uh, the common carotid breaks into the internal and external carotid, and the internal carotid sort of snakes up through and through the eye sockets there. That's called the ethmoidals. Those ethmoidals, uh, you can see that basically there's just capillaries that are real close to the, to the skin. So if we could figure out how to really do this, this would be remarkable. We think some people think, um, and based on, uh, I had um, worked with a psychi psychiatrist out at Musk, who thought maybe that uh, the time course of this suggests that it was uh, that it was brain activity and that it was related to fMRI, but we just never been able to. It's a what you actually see is that again head movement is an issue. Uh, blinking, blinking is a big issue. It's a small response. It does appear to be there, but maybe not in everybody. Again, individual differences. We don't know. Maybe that's a problem. Um, so. A second uh, idea with uh, specifically with thermal imaging was, well, let's, let's do a non-contact polygraph, which is actually kind of fascinating. Um, I'm just gonna check and see what I'm doing on time. I tend to, it uh, looks like we're at uh, three o'clock. So we've got till 3.45. So I guess we're still good. Uh, this is, uh, this is- um, uh, we, we got yeah. to 3.15. Um, oh, 3.15, okay. Yeah, about 20 3. minutes more. All righty. Yeah, we'll just keep, I guess we'll just go until, uh, until we run out of time. <laughs> but uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the idea with respiration is uh, tidal, obviously tidal volume, which is uh, the amount of uh, air that's uh, uh, breathed in and out. Um, and, and, and it's about 500 milliliters in a normal healthy person every time they breathe. And what you're basically seeing there is that the breath is uh, warmer when, uh, when, he, when you breathe it out in the background and you're able to do some things, uh, some uh, integration, figure out, uh, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the temperature differences. And uh, you can see that's what the actual data look like. I wanna, I wanna show you uh, for full, <laughs> you, you know, uh, transparency. It's, it's not as pretty as uh, uh, sometimes as they show it, but, but it's there, you can see. Uh, when someone breathes, you can definitely see the waveform that uh, and you can clean that up quite a bit and get some pretty interesting uh, uh, data. This is also, uh, you, this is the sweat response also looked at from a thermal imager. Uh, this would be Army Night Vision Labs who has uh, pioneered this effort. Uh, the idea is, um, is that you, now you're getting a, basically a, a more direct uh, measure of sweat, the sweat response. You can see that's not a mustache on that, uh, that person under his nose, that's actually a uh, sweat pores opening up. And uh, when that happens, that cools the surrounding, uh, the temperature decreases and you see the, so this is just a grayscale, a grayscale image. And uh, on, uh, it looks like uh, thermal does a real good job on the hand. Unfortunately, what we discovered on our, to our chagrin, again, getting from the field, sorry, from the lab to the field is that, believe it or not, on the face, uh, it only, uh, a good response like that, it only occurs in about 12%, 15% of people. 
It's variable. There seems to be a genetic basis to it. So, uh, different areas of the face and some people you don't see much at all. And so in certain people, it's a great response, but it's not something that you can uh, reliably get a reliable signal from. But again, research on that is continuing. Uh, final thing with thermal, this was uh, pioneered here in our lab at uh, uh, NCCA. The idea here is that uh, the guy's name was Greg Cutlip. I worked with him uh, in the same branch for a couple of years. He was an engineer and physiologist. And uh, so the statistical technique uh, I came up with. But the idea is, hey, instead of looking at these uh, sort of phasic responses, let's look at more tonic. Uh, as, the, as you ask questions um, over a longer period of time on specific topics, and what you see here, what, the, what you're actually seeing in this uh, slide is um, basically what I did was uh, thresholding. So you threshold, again, trying to do what a polygraph does, which is compare that person to that person, the same person over time. So if you break it into eight um, um, temperature bands or regions and you do one half standard deviations, below and above the, the mean, so you get eight actual regions, you actually start to see changes that are actually visible with the naked eye. So that was just a way of graphically representing it. And this next, uh, what you're seeing here is the actual results of the study. And what we're, uh, what Greg uh, Cutlip had called thermal capacitance. The idea is basically like a light bulb getting turned on and off, on and off slowly over time, it's gonna heat up over a, over a longer period of time. And this typically happens more in the cheek region because the cheek is, uh, you know, it's, it's got uh, the, the, that fatty deposits that make it, um, uh, you know, heat up and cool down um, less, less rapidly. And so that, that response was, that was significant as well. And we're, this is another ongoing area of research that we're looking at. Uh, final thing I'm going to try to get through, at least this before we uh, move on, but uh, this is the automated interviews that I'm really hoping to get some serious help <laughs> from you folks with, which is, uh, again, it's in terms of what it is, it's very straightforward. Think a uh, computer game. Um, uh, if those of you who know of Unity is the game engine. It was actually created in Unity. Battelle Memorial Institute is the folks that came up with it. It's 3D. Uh, interview or it interviews you and um, um, asks you questions, listens for your responses, and then comes up with follow on questions. Um, the automated interviews, uh, a lot of people in the field, um, it, it's seen probably as the most far out thing that we do. And in the sense of, you know, why do we need this? So I'm always trying to defend the position of why it's important. There are many, many reasons, I think. One is just in terms of human computer interactions. Um, and we know humans are prone to biases and distortions. Certainly so are computer algorithms, but those are different. Uh, humans, uh, um, you know, as we know, and as we're seeing in the news every day, there are these um, you know, distortions that people uh, unintentionally bring to the table. So um, also obviously um, with these new technologies come massive data streams, uh, computers able to process a large amount of information, unburdened decision makers, and, and obviously uh, so simplifying strategies has to do with when folks you know, are under the kind of time stress that, that uh, some of these interviewers are and interrogator, you know, interviewers that do this type of thing day in and day out. They do, you know, it forces humans to make simplifying assumptions. We think computers can help with that. Uh, I'm going to skip the video and just felt welcome anyone who would like to come out to the lab and we'll, I'll show you many videos. Uh, anyone who likes to see the system, I'm happy to show it to them. Uh, we think automated interviews bring us, bring a lot more to the table than that though. We think automated interviews um, allow us to simulate random responses. Now you're getting into things like game theory getting uh, can, can people all the way back to von Neumann and the idea that can people be truly random? Uh, in some cases, the answer to that is probably no. Um, and then, um, you know, then the question is, well, if we tweak the system, if, if we let these agents, these computer agents, you know, certain types of feedback, 
will the liars or even, you know, versus truth tellers, will they read more into that or less into that? Will they change their behavior? And we want to look at um, that as well. This is uh, very simple. This just shows uh, we actually plugged in uh, a, a lab grade polygraph to an automated interview. And that's actually a, um, that is a sweat response. Again, you can see the questions are more bunched up now, but it's, uh, those are the types of questions that we uh, typically uh, ask during the automated interviews. And you're actually getting those, those phasic kind of um, um, responses. It also allows us to do things like ask uh, uh, different kinds of questions in psychology. There's something called the forced choice question where we give you an option, but you got to pick one makes it a little more challenging than yes or no. Ambiguous questions, open-ended questions where we actually get uh, a longer response, uh, a verbal sentences worth of responses from the interviewees. So we're really looking at that. This shows uh, one of the automated interviews that we did early on. This is 2014. And we just, the automated interviewers in the old days were really just decision agents, more like if then, if then, almost like a, um, like uh, like an interview in psychiatry where you would where they had books and you ask a question they answer you you turn the page and you know ask a different question based on their response that's basically what we were doing but we were doing it in real time and you can see that uh, uh, importantly that uh, the the people that were being interviewed we asked them questions much like they would be asked on an actual security screening interview this is not a polygraph but a just an interview, an entrance, inter, you know, sort of a new hire interview that you would get. We asked similar types of questions and you can see that the first is the paper and pencil, the CG interviewer, the, uh, the agent, the automated agent uh, got uh, a lower percentage of no admission. So they typically admitted to something, especially on the uh, emotion uh, type of questions. So uh, history of uh, basically mental health issues, um, far more interesting responses to the CG agent for that. Uh, again, these are the numbers. You can see some of the admissions about everything from drinking alcohol to uh, were you ever on probation, parole, went to jail. So we're getting these kinds of admissions, which is important. And we're also getting admissions to these open-ended kind of questions, which is really interesting. So these folks, when we said, what we did was we asked those forced choice kind of questions, but we also went ahead and asked um, open-ended questions. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? We got folks um, uh, answering those kind of questions as well, which opens up, a, frankly, a whole another area of uh, research on uh, on these longer, you know, verbal responses, linguistic responses of deception. Um, these are the types of responses we, uh, we got just to, you know, again, just shows uh, more of the same, but shows that they are in fact making many admissions. This, uh, this is the automated interview in the first phase. This is around 2010, 2011 timeframe. Again, simple decision agent. We would, we would create an interview much like you. And if, if you remember the old days when you had, uh, you know, uh, tracks, you want to listen to a music track, you would click on the track. Well, it was kind of like that, where we just uh, had, but it was automated. So if the question, it, the interviewer would ask a question, listen for a response, depending on the response, he would ask follow-up question. Uh, during the second sort of phase of uh, this, this uh, re these research studies, we improved the automated interviewer somewhat and the focus during the second phase of studies was more about uh, trying to create to some degree what we would call embodied agents so we had uh, we integrated these new some of these new technologies and fed those responses back into so when I say embodied I'm not really speaking about the external environment but in this case I'm speaking about the physiology of the examinee so the examiner the computer generated, uh, program would have access to the uh, physiology of the examinee in real time. We were not, again, very simple things like, are they moving their head too much? And then the 
you know, the computer would say, please stop moving your head, you know, but simple things. But the idea was we're trying to, trying to get to somewhat of an embodied uh, uh, interviewer. Uh, summarizing, I think some of the benefits, the three main benefits, uh, automation of information processing, which leads to standardization, which we believe hopefully would build more trust in the process and also synchronization, which believe it or not is a huge problem with these data streams, especially the timing information. We can now do that so we know when questions were asked and we can create databases with third-party programs that know uh, when questions were asked and then just makes developing algorithms a whole lot easier. Another thing is photorealism. There's something called presence, co-presence. Um, Many studies have shown that the more realistic the automated interviewer is, the better, uh, more, the more present the interviewee feels in the uh, situation. And in fact, more co-presence, which co-presence has to do with the idea that there's another uh, entity with them, which in this case would be the automated interviewer. So they're treating the automated interviewer more like a human, the more realistic that you can get. The, uh, uh, we're about 2014 <laughs> with our system, but this just shows you, this is actually from Unity, the game engine downloaded this. This is 2016, uh, something I created with Unity myself just to show it was doable. And then if you look at 2020, you're almost at photorealistic in my opinion. Um, so we're trying to get some, uh, some drums and research uh, money and time to, uh, to, get the, uh, to get some photorealistic um, Interviewers is another thing we definitely want to try to do and to get from reactive agents more toward deliberate agents and embodied agents uh, modeling these components. So uh, when I say models here, I'm talking about models of the potential emotional states of the examinees, but also planning given in that you now you're again, you're again getting into more of a game theoretic kind of thing. Uh, if the uh, machine thinks that the human thinks this, then we do that and uh, try to get a more, um, moving it more to a more autonomous uh, agent uh, based on callback functions and, and hopefully, yeah, so, you, you know, functions, delegates, those kinds of things where you can implement these functions in real time. I'm not going to, I'm probably going to run out of time, so I'm going to speed through this, but I just wanted to, this is, um, one other major thing that we do, I touched on this earlier, but this is ground truthing. This is actually coming up with um, sophisticated mock crimes that we can then uh, uh, generate uh, anxiety, enough anxiety in the examining the humans that uh, we see realistic uh, physiology, right? In this case, we had someone try to get through a security checkpoint. The idea here was industrial espionage. They went through and they destroyed a, a new component. Um, all this, of, of course, was not real, but uh, but the uh, the participants did not know that. And we we ran the automated agent as well as a traditional polygraph, um, as well as something called a laser Doppler. Really interesting results. Um, uh, what I what I'd like to focus on real quick on this slide is this is simple response time. But what you see there is that the deceptives, uh, when they asked a, an upfront questions, when they decided to answer that yes or no, and it was their decision, what they did on that upfront question uh, affected questions later on to a point where it seemed like the deceptives were actually um, they're developing a strategy one of several kinds of deceptive strategies and, and they tend to stick to that strategy. So again, the big difference here was, was what they decided to do on that so-called PICQ or upfront question, um, depending on when they said yes or no, they look more like the non-deceptives. So again, verbal response time, verbal response duration is something we looked at. Nothing again to write home about, but 59% correct just on response time. That's not looking at any other measures. And what you see is that uh, the, the whole reason we were able to do better than chance was because we were able, we, we just looked at um, a simple sort of uh, like a, uh, a simple uh, test based on uh, 
you know, whether they were within the window of chance and they, they were 59% uh, was due to the ability to classify non-deceptive participants, to know when someone was telling the truth. And we interpreted this finding as due to, again, subpopulation of deceptive participants uh, employing various strategies. In other words, perhaps the truthfuls are doing a more monolithic kind of strategy. They just sort of do it the same way, whereas the deceptives, they come up with different ideas of how they're gonna, how they're gonna beat the system. Um, and so I'm, I know I'm just about out of time. This is really kind of a decent place to stop. I could go through another study, but if you'd like, I can move on to the end now and just sort of wrap up. I'm gonna leave that. Yeah, it'll be nice uh, to wrap you. up now because I need yeah. to spend a few minutes with the class. All righty, so what I'm gonna do is, uh, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite everybody to come back and see the rest of these slides. There's a couple more interesting things, but like I said, I hope that, um, what I'd like to be able to say is, uh, I think that I've, I've presented enough here to show that this is a major problem, a big problem, and we can use help from many different disciplines and, and areas of research. Um, and it's bigger than one uh, subdiscipline. And um, clearly a lot of what we're looking at, uh, we think we could get help from folks that are, uh, that are computer sciences and engineers. And so we're hoping that you, uh, if some of you find this interesting enough that you'll uh, be interested in, uh, in helping us um, down the line. So uh, I wanna thank everyone for listening. I want to uh, again, thank, I, don't, I wanna thank my collaborators over at uh, NCCA have been, have been great. They're a great team to work with. And I also wanna thank um, I would like to thank, uh, again, everyone, uh, for listening, everyone, uh, um, please, uh, um, uh, feel free to contact me at any time. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. And, um, again, I appreciate the, uh, the interest. I appreciate Dr. Sheff and Dr. Matthews and everybody in computer science. Thank you very much. Well, fantastic. I'm going to upload the slides on the LinkedIn so that uh, you guys can look at it. Uh, you will still have then Dean's email in case somebody wants to reach out to uh, to him. And uh, um, I don't know whether Dean is open for uh, students to be involved in some sort of activity like internship or such, but... Uh, um, uh, yes, we are going to, I mean, we're, we're always looking into those kinds of things and we absolutely, I, I have nothing concrete, but what I can say is we'll go back and we'll uh, try to make it happen. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Dean. I think, uh, is there, does anybody uh, want to ask any question? Hi, uh, I have just one question, but I'm a little confused about what the learning objective here is. Is it to learn the decept deception strategy as a planning problem, like stringing together the conversation? Or is it to learn whether or not there is deception given the conversation uh, using some machine learning framework? Or is it both together? Other than you know, the HCP Yeah, I think it's both together. I, I see these, I, what I'd like to know what I'd like to know from someone who's really smart in computer science is how do we get from the computer science ideas of uh, essentially graph theory, nodes and, and edges and, you know, as it applies to language versus, you know, some of the, uh, some, uh, someone who's interviewing these deceptive folks and, you know, how are these, how they're subtly using words differently. I think it goes back to maybe Noam Chomsky type of thing, but Again, these are these are something that you know I would love to have a long discussion with someone about how we could figure that out. But I think the answer is both. We what we want is a computer agent that can automate, take you know, free up human resources, but also make some kind of decision about whether these folks are um, you know, what concerns them, what may and potentially what they're lying about. Does does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dean. I uh, appreciate um, I think uh, uh, this is a very new, um, uh, a very, you know, we're looking for diversity in this class. Uh, this is an advanced seminar class, and I think students probably got what they're looking for. So thank you very much.